but it also gives me the chance to have the last word. <laughs> this occasion is the beginning of the end of my presidency, for this will be the last council dinner I will host as president. Thankfully, the forces of nature combined with two even more powerful forces within the college to ensure that nature was tamed. We had a glorious day outside, which was matched only by the atmosphere inside, I think it's fair to say. Since we're breaking tradition, I thought I will break tradition by giving the first thank you to my dear wife, Rita. Thank you for being there. Thank you for holding the fort and the family while I pursued my various responsibilities. Every college officer in this room and beyond knows that we owe a huge debt of gratitude to our respective wives, husbands, our spouses, who contribute a great amount silently and unsung to the work that we do. So I take this opportunity to thank them all. As many times in the past, I have very often turned to my wife to ask, what shall I say in my speech this time? And when I did that a few days ago, she did not even look up from the book that she was reading and said, nobody has ever complained that the speech was too short. <laughs> so keep it short and keep it straight like a schoolboy's haircut. <laughs> of course I chuckled because this boy had never had a haircut. <laughs> not as a schoolboy and not as a big boy. In fact, my hair is anything but short and straight. But let me take you back to an anecdote. When I was a schoolboy of 13 years of age, I, I think it will convince you, as it has convinced me, that it was, even at that age, my destiny to stand before you here today. I wanted to fa follow my father into the Air Force and be an Air Force pilot. He would have nothing to do with it. He said, you have to graduate from university first. And between him and I, we decided I would become an aeroplane engineer, whatever that meant. Aeronautical was not a word in my vocabulary then. So even when I had to write an essay on my ambition in life, it was an aeroplane engineer. To be an engineer, I had to take physics, chemistry, and mathematics, which I did. And because the school in which I studied did not take boys beyond the age of 13, I always wondered why. 9, 10, and 11th was only for girls. They put me in a boarding school in New Delhi. A 13-year-old, first time away from home, <coughs> going to do engineering, sort of high schooling. I, I was a bit nervous on my own. So I met this young boy called Kanwar. He and I became friends for a week before school started in the boarding school. We did lots of things, played cricket, swam, this, that, and the other. And the first day of school, Kanwal was not in the class. First class, first session was over. The second, he didn't come. After the third session, I was a bit concerned. What happened? Why didn't he come to school? I went out, and there I saw him in the playground. I said, where have you been? You missed first day of school. He said, no, I was in the class. You weren't there. I said, no, I was there. So which class? I said, there. He said, that's, bi that's mathematics. I'm in biology. So I picked up my bag, <laughs> went out, and sat. 9B biology. <laughs> I became a doctor. <laughs> that was the first card destiny had played. Years rolled by, I came to the UK, started as an SHO in Huddersfield, and at that time everybody had advised me to make a career in ophthalmology in this country, you must get into a teaching hospital. So a job came up as SHO, a senior house officer in Nottingham. And I applied and I told my consultant, can you help me? He wrote a letter to Mr. Nick Gallery, who was then a consultant. And I got a letter back saying, you have not been shortlisted. <laughs> well, years rolled by. I went to Aberdeen, worked over there for a few years. And the second defining moment occurred. 
But pure chance, a long story, we're going to go into that, but pure chance, pure coincidence, against a lot of odds. I found myself in a session in Amsterdam reading a free paper. The session was chaired by one Professor Larry A. Donoso from the Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. He and I got chatting after that. He offered me a research position over there in Philadelphia. And there I was, flourished under him. People came to know of my work. And believe it or not, exactly 10 years from the date when I was refused this house, of, house job in Nottingham, Larry and I were having lunch in the cafeteria of the hospital and the phone rang. Somebody picked it up, Dr. Dua, are you here? I said, yes, yeah, it's, it's for you. It was a member of the Senate of the University of Nottingham saying, we'd like to invite you to the chair in Nottingham. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank Larry Donoso, who has traveled all the way from Philadelphia to be here with us today. Oh. He has been a mentor and a friend all these years. Larry, thank you for being what you are, and thank you for your immeasurable influence, positive influence on me and many others like me. Larry also helped us create a US denomination of our anniversary stamp. Uh, we, we, we created a stamp to mark our 25th anniversary. There's a long story, but we were refused locally in the, in the UK. So Larry created one in America for us, and then we managed to get one in the UK as well. So thank you for that as well, Larry. Six months after that phone call, I found myself in Nottingham, and I had a great time in Nottingham. I'd like to introduce and thank people from Nottingham who are here today. From my workplace, our clinical director, Anwar Zaman. We have uh, my academic secretary, Eunice, and her husband, Roger. Winfred Amwaku, who you all know, and his wife, Ruby. And my friends, uh, Professor Nath Puri is here, Paramjeet and Gurdeep, Dr. Paramjeet, Humayu, Jaha, and there are many others who have really helped and supported me during these years. It was my destiny to be president of the best institution in the world in a silver anniversary year. I have been graced by the camaraderie and friendship of great men and women, privileged to work with the best, honored by their support, and humbled by their great work. One professional career path leads through many different routes and is punctuated by successes and achievements. I have had my fair share of those, but none gives me greater honor and none gives me greater pride than the office that I currently hold. It's a great institution that has been made by the hard work of the people in it. The, the council members, many of them who are here, <coughs> are staff to name <coughs> Kathy Evans, Penny, Alex, Emily, Beth, Aziz, that many of them have all contributed tirelessly, and so many other members of the college wider family. The Royal Colleges are this nation's greatest assets, one of the greatest assets of this nation, and long may that remain so. It is all a team effort, and the exemplar of team working really I saw in, in the college. And it takes me back to one more anecdote before I finish. I had a nurse who every morning started the cleaning, brought me a cup of tea, and then we started cleaning. One day in my clinic in Nottingham, she did not come, there was another nurse. So I saw one or two patients and she hadn't brought me tea. And then it was, the clinic was going very slow. So she was standing and she said, since there's nothing for me to do here, may I go? I said, would you mind getting me a cup of tea? She said, what, me in my blue uniform? Expect me to get it. I said, I'm very sorry I asked. Your colleague used to do it. And to be honest, I said, you know, if, if I'm free and you were working and you wanted me 
to get you a cup of tea, <coughs> I'll gladly do so. It's all about team working. Three fourths of team is tea. He just came to me. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, For that, I'll get you a cup of tea. And brought me once ever since. <laughs> Which brings me to today. I sincerely thank Lord Pearson, who very generously and kindly used his good offices to bring us to this excellent and prestigious venue and welcomed all of you at the beginning on behalf of the college.